four. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Science Pub, where we bring the top minds from Oregon State University out of the lab, and in these times, our new online events. We have a little bit different setup tonight as uh, the event is being broadcast to you from the new studio at the OSU Cascades Innovation Co-Lab. This evening's presentation, the pandemic we were not prepared for, will hopefully engage the audience in the science, politics, and the future of pandemics and our lives. Joining us online is OSU's own Professor Junwei Chi, whom I will introduce shortly. So for tonight, just like we've done the last couple nights uh, where we've had our science pubs, we're gonna be using multiple audience feedback means. Um, first off, if you're joining us through YouTube Live or Facebook Live pages, you can leave questions in the chat uh, that you would have uh, for the professor um, as we go through this evening's events. You can also use our Mentimeter app. Uh, if you go to www.menti.com. Tonight, we're gonna be looking for event number 4641. Five five four. So you can input that right in uh, directly in your um, mobile device, or you can find the app at your relative app store. But again, we're going to look for four six four one five five four. We've got about five hundred folks again uh, registered for tonight's event. So again, another great turnout for Science Pub. So if your questions are not answered this evening, please feel free to submit uh, to events at osucascades.edu. So before we get to it, we were running a couple trivia slides before we started the show tonight. Let's go ahead and run through those now as we get those set up. And like last time, we had a little bit of a delay, so bear with me. All right. So going through, um, first question, what is the name of the virus that causes the COVID-19 disease? That is C, SARS-CoV-2. The first case of COVID-19 was found in B, China. C, what is the main method for COVID-19, uh, how it spreads among humans? Droplets and aerosol, question D. What is or are common symptoms of COVID-19? D all of the above. What is the physical function of facial masks in preventing COVID-19? Correct answer on that one is C, minimizes the spread of viruses from exhaling and inhaling. And what does that symbol up there say? What does it stand for? B, on average, how many people will be infected from one confirmed case in the absence of effective intervention? Number seven, based on the current knowledge, how long a person who recovered from COVID-19 infection will maintain immunity against COVID-19? And A, the answer is three to five months. Number eight, what is the average COVID-19 case fatality rate, the total number of COVID-19 deaths, divided by the total number of people who were confirmed being infected with COVID-19 for the United States so far? D, that is 2.5 to 5%. Number nine, among all age groups in the US and most high income nations, which group currently and cumulatively so far have the highest rate of confirmed cases? That is C, 20 to 29. And number 10, last trivia question for the night. What does it mean that COVID-19 pandemic in the US has been politicized? Correct answer that is D, people with different political traits see the scientific evidence of the COVID-19 pandemic differently and responded in a different way. So that's it for the trivia for the night. Uh, let us know in chat how many of those you got correct. This is clearly a topic tonight that lots of us have had firsthand experience with, um, or at least lots and lots of information. Um, and tonight, our speaker is just one of those folks that have been contributing to uh, the information around COVID-19, and he's gonna be joining us this evening. In addition to being professor for the Global Health and Health System and Policy Programs at OSU, Dr. Chun-Li Chi is the director for the Center of Global Health through the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. Beyond Oregon State University, he serves as a visiting professor for the Global Health and Development Program at Taipei Medical University and the International Health Program at National Yangming University, both in Taiwan. Dr. Chi earned his Bachelor of Science in Public Health from the China Medical University Department of Public Health his Master's of Public Health in International Health from the University of Texas School of Public Health, 
and his Doctor of Science in Health Policy and Management at Harvard University's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Chi is passionate about international health development, communitarian equity and efficiency in health and healthcare, and public finance healthcare systems. And over the last eight months, I believe he has been asked more about tonight's topic than all the other researchers combined at OSU. His expertise has been utilized across all means of written and digital media, and we are thankful to have him here tonight. On behalf of the audience tonight, I'd like to thank you for your time, Dr. Chi, and I'll turn it over to you. Should I begin my sharing? Uh -huh. That'd be great. Good evening. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me uh, this evening to share my knowledge and experience of uh, researching, working on this pandemic of the COVID-19. And tonight, my topic is the pandemic that we were not prepared for, and the science, politics, and the future of pandemic and our life. And my talk is divided into four sections. The first section, I will focus on a quick overview uh, of this pandemic, including the viruses that caused the, the pandemic. On the second section, I will review uh, how the different country, different region in the world uh, responded uh, to this pandemic with very different policy, different approach and different consequences. On the third section, uh, I will give you an example uh, of a very successful control uh, of this pandemic and how we can learn from this example, the gold standard of controlling the COVID-19 pandemic. And the last section I will conclude with the world after the pandemic. Now let's start uh, with the, the first section, the, a quick overview uh, of this pandemic. So this is a photo of the past science part. Had it not for the pandemic, the science part would be looked like this. This is the scientific talk with the pop side of the food and drinks. And because of the pandemic, uh, we are not able to gather like the picture shows from the previous uh, science part. And I hope uh, in, the, in the not too long distance future, we will be able to resume uh, to event like that. And before I start, I'd like to share with you, some of you might have uh, knowledge or memory about the, so far the world's biggest industrial disaster, the 1984 Bhopal gas disaster that happened in Bhopal, India. I'm not going to talk about the detail of this disaster. What has in common between this Bhopal disaster and this pandemic is what I call triple failure. What happened in the 1984 Bhopal gas leak is it a cloud of uh, methyl isocyanate gas, extremely toxic and lethal, was leaked from a uh, union carbide plant uh, in, in Bhopal. And I mentioned that triple failure that happened uh, in the Bhopal plant of union, union carbide was there were safety devices, three duplicate uh, redundant safety devices to prevent exactly this kind of disaster from happening. So for this kind of disaster to happen, all three safety devices will have to fail at the same time. And prior to the disaster, uh, in the annual, annual review and examination, uh, the expert keep, uh, give the society uh, the guarantee uh, to have all these three safety devices fail at the same time, the probability is one in several million. That means it's impossible to happen. Yet it happened. And that mimic what we are dealing with it now, similar triple failure. So I just drew this chart this morning uh, to illustrate. So the first failure come to the 
from the country of origin, the country that started uh, having this, this uh, virus, the, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, that is China. Uh, that first layer of failure was China was not disclosing the highly contagious nature of this disease and allow it to spread throughout the world. That's the first layer of failure. But then the second big failure, what I call global health governance, in which the World Health Organization represents that global health governance. The WHO could have acted earlier and prevented that spread. So this is a big safety guard that also failed. That WHO was very slow to respond. And then that virus was allowed to spread all over the world. And then we have the last layer of safety guard. I call it national policy and societal response. And later I will discuss how this varies. We know that this first two layer failed. And that doesn't necessarily have to lead to the last safety guard fail. But uh, different country uh, has different level of success or failure. Uh, at, at this last safety guard. So that's the similarity between the current pandemic and the, the Bhopal disaster. And this is a cartoon to illustrate how WHO was so slow to respond. And the first cases happened in China on November and Taiwan gave the first warning on December 31st in 2019. Yet, WHO wait till March 11, 2020 to declare it's a pandemic. In 2003, uh, there was a similar pandemic, SARS, some of you might remember. Con contrary to this time, WHO responded very quickly. And there's a, one exactly a uh, similar uh, event happened, actually two. Uh, SARS also originated in China and similarly in 2003, initially China tried to hide it uh, from the world, but WHO took action very quickly uh, within a week of being notified about this highly contagious disease. WHO sent its expert to, to investigate uh, in China, in Southern China. Unfortunately, that expert Died of that infection. And one dramatic event was WHO uh, announced the emergency in time. And when a whole uh, airplane load of Singapore Airline was from flying from Asia with a full load of passengers, many of the passengers were already carrying the viruses. And before it landed in Frankfurt, WHO announced that emergency. And Germany was able to quarantine the entire plane load of staff and, and passengers. And that spared the entire Europe from suffering from the SARS. And similarly, because of WHO's early action, early response prevented Africa, South America, and most North America, except Toronto, uh, from suffering from the SARS. So that was able to contain uh, the spread of the SARS largely into the neighboring country of China. Had WHO responded similarly with 2003 in a swift manner, we won't be in this uh, pandemic uh, right now. This next slide is a quick uh, overview of the timeline. So far, we know the first case identified in Wuhan was November 17. And November 30, China sent a delegate to investigate uh, in Wuhan. Uh, 31st, China's delegate uh, arrived. That same day, uh, Taiwan sent the first warning to WHO, International Health Regulation on the possible human-to-human -human transmission. That same day, Taiwan was also the first nation to take early action, started on board inspection of all passengers flying from Wuhan to Taiwan. Both China and WHO waited until January 20, to announce that this disease is highly contagious. And the WHO waited till March 11th to announce this outbreak as a pandemic. And again, WHO has been very slow to respond, waited till June 5th 
issue guidance to recommend facial mask wearing for general public. Initially, WHO uh, opposed the facial mask. And on June 7, Taiwan lifted all cloud gathering restrictions. Data ever mentioned that. And last week, uh, the US CDC finally acknowledged that COVID-19 is airborne when uh, the mounting evidence was already uh, accumulated by June. And there was a large group of scientists from around the world uh, wrote a joint data to WHO uh, strongly urging WHO to take this into consideration in modifying its uh, prevention policy. And this next chart, uh, by the way, in this talk, I, I will show you a lot of chart and, and photo to illustrate uh, how this disease spread. This is a comparison between the COVID-19 and other common communicable diseases. So well, it is a relative low mortality rate, but also highly contagious. So this is the shape uh, of the virus called SARS-CoV-2. And this is a comparison uh, for the coronavirus family. By the way, the, the media often use the generic term coronavirus, which is not very specific because corona, these are all from the family of coronavirus. They all have a similar shape, but different nature. And here is the, the SARS-CoV-2. And this is the SARS from 2003. And these two are most closely uh, resembling each, each other. And we also learn the effect of infection is for this COVID-19 is a combination of SARS and HIV AIDS. So besides lung damage, uh, it also attacked immune system and multiple organ failure. Some people who recover uh, from, from this infection will have a long lasting uh, impact uh, on their immune system or on their, their organ. So it, it has been more than nine months since the pandemic started. By now, we have learned a lot more than what we knew back then in February or March. The most important uh, new knowledge we confirm now is, is airborne through the aerosol. And because of its airborne nature, it makes the facial mask wearing far more important than distance. Also, we learned that asymptomatic and mild symptom patients, they play the major role of transmission. Unfortunately, uh, there's a large proportion of the general public are not aware of that. Many of them mistakenly thought if I don't have symptoms or I have mild symptoms, I'm not contagious. That's completely wrong. They play the major role of transmitting the disease. And most patients are highly contagious during the early stage usually the first seven to 10 days uh, from the onset of infection. Also, we learned the lens of immunity is very limited. And the lens of immunity is in general proportional to the severity of symptom. That means if someone got infected and with more severe symptom and survived, uh, that person in general will acquire a longer immunity. Whereas someone infected without symptom, generally uh, that immunity is very short. Uh, so far, researchers have found out some of the asymptomatic infection, their immunity doesn't last more than one month. That means, and we already have strong evidence, people could be reinfected. And I have known someone who have been re reinfected twice. And also, one of the good news now is if you compare the case fatality rate uh, month by month. By now, for most country, the case fatality rate are much lower than say in February and March because the clinician, the physicians, they know much better about how to properly uh, treat the patient. So that's the good news that the survival rate by now is much higher than early on. And particularly in this country, uh, our society suffer from uh, disagreement, uh, particularly about politicizing this pandemic. 
And there are still a lot of uh, people who assume this is whole pandemic is a hoax. Despite more than 7 million American infected, more than 210,000 people died. There are still a substantial, by substantial, my estimate is between 15 to 20%. Uh, Americans still don't believe there is a pandemic. And that including some political leaders. And so I show the next two slides, uh, a strong evidence to show that this is no common flu. So this is an example from four countries, Spain, England, Wales, Germany, and Norway. Compared with previous year, this is the excessive deaths that they compared with previous five years. And these are individual state from New York City, Michigan, Illinois, Massachusetts, et cetera, compared with, again, previous years on the same months. We, in each state, they all observe excessive deaths. So this is no common flu. And well, on average, uh, the older people, their case fatality rate uh, are higher, meaning on average, older people, if they're infected, they have a higher uh, fatality rate than younger people. And this, this is the data showing from four countries, South Korea, Spain, China, and Italy. But at the same time, uh, it's the young people uh, who accum accumulate most of the cases. And this is the data uh, from August uh, for the United States. The bar represents as percent of total infected. So in August, this age group, 22, 29, uh, has the highest percentage of total infected, followed by 30 to 39. Similarly, the curve represents instance per 100,000. They also represent that young age group. So that's a quick overview on the science part of the COVID-19 and the virus. In the next section, uh, I'm going to introduce and review the global responses and consequences, particularly how different countries adopt different policy. I categorize uh, the country response into five groups. And each group, I, I use one country as an example, but in general, there are more than one country that follow that particular group. So the first group is uh, represented by Sweden. And Sweden is probably the only country that persistently following this strategy of herd immunity. By herd immunity, the idea is it's not irresponsive, it's intentional that for, for the government to take that policy to let more people, particularly younger generation, to expose to the virus. And the idea is when there are enough people infected, in general, there need to be at least half of the population infected. Then it creates a herd immunity, which will dramatically slow down the spread uh, of the disease. However, given the science we knew about the, the short lifespan of immunity, uh, this policy has been questioned and criticized. The United Kingdom started with the same policy, but in March, uh, after strong objection uh, from, from the public, as well as the, the prime minister got infected, they switched gear to abandon the herd immunity approach. The second group represented by Italy, uh, initially very slow response, and they suffer severe consequences in terms of deaths and cases. And then they immediately locked down and was able to contain that. And besides Italy, uh, there's a several uh, European country uh, follow that similar model. The US uh, is kind of a unique mode that we are one of the few country, probably the other country is Brazil uh, that started with denial, rejecting the, the information or scientific evidence of this uh, pandemic that slowed down uh, of the re response. And to this state, we still don't have a uniform national policy in, in controlling this uh, pandemic. The fourth group uh, represented by South Korea. 
it has a well-developed legal framework, particularly one unique approach of South Korea, which later uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Germany, and several other European countries also adopted mass testing. And with its advanced planning and advanced deployment, South Korea was the first nation that initially suffered a major community outbreak, but was able to effectively and within a short time contain it. The last group is Taiwan. Later, I'll, I will give more detailed example. Uh, it shares some similarity with South Korea with well-developed legal framework prior to this pandemic. But what's unique in Taiwan is precision contact tracing rather than mass testing. And that precision contact tracing is dependent on the well-established legal framework because that infringe on personal privacy of your cell phone signals. And several countries adopted that strategy, uh, Israel and New Zealand, for example. So this is a quick overview of those bar represent different continent in terms of the accumulated case from December all the way to the end of September. And the curve represent the deaths again from early this year to uh, last month. In spring, there was a, a debate in the international media about whether an authoritarian government is more effective in containing this pandemic. But researcher has uh, compiled evidence showing, no, you don't have to be an authoritarian uh, government to effectively contain that. In fact, based on the data they accumulated, uh, democracy seem to have more advantage than non-democracy in terms of containing this uh, pandemic. But at the same time, researcher also found out there is no absolute pattern between authoritarian government versus democracy. Meaning in both category, you have, we can find success and not so successful uh, policy. And this is from the world data showing uh, total confirmed cases versus uh, deaths. And we can see the pattern that the more cases the country have, on average, uh, there's more deaths, with some exception, and US is alone out, out here. And the case fatality rate compared with age group. So this is a country around the world in terms of their median age. The median age reflect the level of aging society. So on the right, when the median age is higher, that means on average, the society is older or they have larger population in, in the elderly group. Uh, on the left-hand side, the median age is very young, meaning they have very young population. But what's interesting in of case fatality, it has no clear relationship between whether the society is aging or not, because in each group, you can see the variation. In a very aging group, you can see high mortality, low mortality, similar to the median group and the young group, you have that variation. In the next three slides, I, I calculated some of the key statistics uh, on some of the country representing those different models I mentioned. And let's focus on case per million and death per million. And the US so far led the world in case per million and deaths per million. And later I will explain more detail about Taiwan's policy uh, is extremely low. And also the deaths per million is very low. And Canada, our neighbor country, uh, also fare much better than uh, the United States. So Canada shares a very similar geography, but is containment uh, has been much more successful than the United States. And then several European country and two big country. Sweden, earlier mentioned, uh, is the country adopted the herd immunity. And as a result, Sweden didn't fare very well compared with other 
uh, European country. It has a relative high case fatality rate, uh, high case per million as well as deaths per million. And two country has been quickly catching up in terms of cases, Brazil and India. So far, both countries still have relative low case fatality rate, but very high number of case per million. And the last group are four countries uh, that represent, among others, a uh, successful control group. And that include country with relative large population like South Korea, and with very small population like Iceland, New Zealand, and then Australia. So this country has relative low case per million, very low case fatality rate. Uh, Iceland probably have one of the world's lowest case fatality rate of 0.28%. And their deaths per million also very low. Likewise, I also looked into the last two weeks, what are the range of the daily new cases? Uh, this is adjusted for population, the daily new cases per million, and they are all relative low. And this is the United States that we would, because we were not doing much of testing. So this uh, extremely low number was a little bit misleading. And when March, we started to catch up with testing, we started to see large cases. And this is when many states started to reopen. Then we started to see the peak and we still at a relative high level of uh, daily new cases. So that's a quick overview uh, on the world. The next section, I will briefly introduce the gold standard of controlling uh, pandemic. And that term is actually the title of a London-based newspaper, The Telegraph, when it report, Taiwan sets gold standard on epidemic response. And this is the map of Taiwan. At the beginning of the pandemic in January, the Johns Hopkins Research Group they predicted, given the, the close proximity with China, plus the most frequent visit uh, between the two countries, Taiwan and China in 2019, uh, it predicted outside of China, Taiwan will be the worst hit country of this pandemic. But the result shows totally contrary. And these are some other international media report including the guardians, the Al Jazeera. So this is the, the most updated statistic. Uh, the orange bar is the daily new cases. The blue, blue bar, uh, the blue curve is the cumulative confirmed cases. As of today, Taiwan's total cases are 529 for a population of 23.7 million. And more remarkably, of these 529 cases, only 55 were domestic cases. And since mid-April, Taiwan no longer had any domestic infection. Also, Taiwan has extremely low uh, fatality, total seven deaths. The last death case happened in early May. Since May, uh, early May, there's no longer any death case. Let me summarize what are those effective measures. First, Taiwan has very effective leadership uh, with strong national coordination and high level of transparency. Taiwan also has a strong infrastructure, but that's not unique to Taiwan. Uh, all the high income country, including the United States, have that condition. And Taiwan also has a universal health care, the national health insurance. And the third point is very unique. Taiwan has advanced planning and advanced deployment. In a way, no country started preparing for this pandemic as early as Taiwan, because Taiwan suffered a very severe consequence of being unprepared for 2003 SARS. So at the end of 2003 SARS pandemic, Taiwan decided never again will Taiwan face another pandemic unprepared. So Taiwan immediately started planning for the next pandemic since 2003. That including endless and lengthy debate of legislation in terms of emergency uh, 
pandemic law in terms of what kind of authority government can have when the, the, the pandemic law is uh, en enacted. And also Taiwan has advanced planning for masks. And Taiwan is the first nation uh, in February to implement universal access to facial mask. Everyone is guaranteed to have access uh, to facial masks and that makes it easy for the government to mandate masks in public transportation, in school and in indoor places because there's no excuse that you don't have access to masks. And also Taiwan has the most effective isolation and quarantine that since April, Taiwan never had any community outbreak. The fourth part is very unique, uh, has a high level of mutual trust between government and the public, and also with public support and social solidarity. And the last one is information technology. And I mentioned earlier, Taiwan used a precision tracking and target testing, we call intelligent electronic fence system to monitor the outbreak, potential outbreak and spread of the viruses. Kind of ironically, Taiwan is not a member of WHO, so Taiwan didn't suffer from WHO's slow re response this time. There were a number of countries, such as Japan and South Korea, uh, suffered that consequence and many other countries too, because they follow WHO's guideline, which is often outdated uh, during this pandemic. And this chart shows the importance of quarantine. And few country has as strict a quarantine as Taiwan did. And this diagram just shows the example of without quarantine, the first person can potentially spread to three, the next uh, started to spread another three and pretty soon it's exponential. So here's the number without quarantine uh, from rung zero, the first person, if it's quarantined, uh, it, you only affect one, uh, but without quarantine, you infect three. The next round nine, by the 10th round, that one person can end up directly infecting nearly 60,000 people by, by 10th round. So Taiwan implemented a very effective uh, quarantine and isolation, and that's contributed to Taiwan's success. Also, the contact tracing, Taiwan traced every single confirmed cases and tried to trace its source and how that, that cases is spread. So this is an, an example chart from the, the first uh, 40, 42 cases. These are the three critical uh, sequential measure which uh, the United States and many European country and other country uh, didn't implement a thoroughly that lead to the not so successful response. The first step is contact tracing, identify who has been exposed, who is at risk. And that followed with accurate testing. And from my observation, the US uh, initial slow response led to under testing and under uh, contact tracing which later catch up by May and June, uh, most state uh, catch up this. However, due to the earlier failure or slow response, and then the later catch up of contact tracing and testing, that led to a very rampant myth or what I call the overconfidence on contact tracing and test that Many people, including policymakers, mistakenly thought as long as we have done this, we should be okay to control the pandemic. No, that's, that's not true because th these are only the first two steps. They are essential condition to control the pandemic, but not sufficient condition. We need the last step. And this last step is where we have not been so successful as well as uh, many European countries or other Asian countries as well. Because the critical question is after you test people positive, what do you do next? And by now we know uh, the asymptomatic and mild symptom patient 
they contribute the most uh, spread of this pandemic. And since we don't effectively isolate them or quarantine them, we continue to let them freely spread uh, this, this viruses. So as long as we don't thoroughly complete this last step, we will be in this pandemic for a much longer time. So this slide summarizes the, the success Taiwan has achieved. Uh, one of the very few countries never had community outbreak. And over five months without any domestic cases. Very low case per million and deaths per million, high recovery rate. And Taiwan achieved that being one of the very few countries never locked down. So in Taiwan, there's no such issue as reopening because nothing was closed. Why? So there's, there's nothing to reopen because everything remained open. School, office, government office, business, restaurant, even bar remain open. And that minimized the damage to the economy. And Taiwan proved that if the society and country does well in pandemic control, one can protect life while also protect livelihood. And there's population effort and support. In July, when Taiwan held a, a big in-person conference, uh, in the, this pandemic, the keynote speaker, the former vice president, Chen Jianze, Dr. Chen Jianze, and a well-known uh, epidemiologist, uh, in that keynote speech, he emphasized uh, Taiwan's success in pandemic control half lies in the government effective policy, but that's essential other half contribution from the general public. Without the general public effort and support, Taiwan won't be so successful. And Taiwan is preparing for the resurgence uh, or potential resurgence. These are some slides uh, uh, Taiwan implemented in effective use of the cell phone uh, information to, to the widespread uh, general public and update and particularly uh, to clear all rumors or fake news. Uh, Taiwan never short of fake news. Uh, in fact, one Swedish organization identified Taiwan as the number one per capita suffering from fake news. And so that became a key issue uh, for the government. And because of Taiwan's war preparation, uh, Taiwan was never short of PPEs. And Taiwan has so abundant of PPE that they can even provide every passenger that Taiwan evacuated from Wuhan with the full PPE. And Taiwan's quarantine was public finance but with a very human face. The government, the local government will provide them uh, books, uh, free video, food, snack, and 14 uh, surgical masks. On April 20th, uh, because of the pandemic control success, Taiwan was the first nation to reopen professional baseball league game. Initially, without live, out, live spectators, but gradually opened to 1,000, 2,000 by June, there was no limit. And I mentioned Taiwan was the first nation to implement universal access to a surgical mask at a very low price, about 17 cents per mask. And they, they even have choice of different color and they can even use, use their national health insurance card to purchase uh, those masks from a vending machine or order it online. And this chart again from world data shows the economic impact uh, by the pandemic. Here's the United States and here's Taiwan. Taiwan among all the nations has the lowest economic impact, impact from the pandemic. And in, in July, the U.S. Secretary, uh, Secretary Azar uh, visited, led a delegation to visit Taiwan and to sign a collaboration between the U.S. and, and Taiwan in, in pandemic control collaboration. And in August, uh, the president of Czech Republic Senate also led a delegate to visit Taiwan uh, to develop uh, more collaboration. And this was a unique event uh, to have a big delegate travel during the pandemic. The last section, let's look at the world after the pandemic. 
So now uh, United States and many other nations are, are facing how can we safely resume our daily activities uh, during this pandemic. And here are some of my recommendations. The first is of course, uh, extensive contact tracing testing, but also need to be followed with treatment and isolation quarantine. And mandatory mask wearing is extremely important, especially now we know this disease is airborne. And because it's airborne, it makes safety physical distance less effective, particularly indoor, because the aerosol uh, in an indoor, not well ventilated space, they can, they can quickly fill the, the, the entire space. And that's important government's role in guiding, assisting, and supervising businesses, school and organization, how to operate safely uh, during the pandemic, because this is brand new disease. Few people have expertise or knowledge how to deal with it. So government and business need to work together to provide guidance, how to safely operate that. And Taiwan shows it is possible because Taiwan never shut down any clothes and uh, any school. And we need to reopen incrementally with restrictions, especially reduce indoor maximum uh, occupancy. And one critical factor is public support and collaboration. Without public support and collaboration, uh, no amount of effective uh, control policy can be implemented. At the same time, we should learn the lesson from this pandemic and help us prepare for the next pandemic. And one of the issue is legal and institutional framework, how to have a more consistent uh, command system in directing the, the society with a consistent message in how to control uh, the pandemic. And that can, can be done at both state level and federal level. Uh, health system strengthening. And also we need to build up our epidemic cap capacity uh, to prepare uh, for the future. And leadership and advanced planning and deployment that we have the knowledge, but we also need to have the political will uh, to plan ahead, to implement ahead. And of course the society's attitude towards uncertainty of novel contagious diseases is very important. In, instead of air in the under preparedness, we would rather air in the overreaction. And here's some example of how Taiwan keep school safe. Throughout the pandemic, all school were open uh, in person and masks are required and during the lunch, they use a shield uh, to, to, to prevent the spread of virus. And at every entrance of the school, they measure the temperature and also spray uh, disinfectant on hands. Similarly, uh, how restaurants remain open during the pandemic in Taiwan. And this is a quote uh, from, from uh, Robert Maddy. It's, it says the COVID-19 has laid bare the cost of confronting a global crisis with a flawed international system. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this pandemic could have been prevented. And we need to re-examine that issue. And when we review different country responses, we see the trade-off, the individualization of risk versus socialization of risk and trading protection of personal privacy versus protection of public safety. And during the, the July conference uh, in, in summarizing, in concluding Taiwan's uh, pandemic control policy, uh, well, the, the vice president of Taiwan said, by July, Taiwan mandatory uh, quarantine over 150,000 people. And he said, we quarantine 150,000 people. So 23.7 me million people don't have to be quarantined. By not having to quarantine means we don't have to lock down. When we have to implement lockdown, we are effectively quarantine every 
individuals. So I will also prove protecting life can also protect livelihood. Again, this data from our world data measuring the decline on the second quarter of economic output. Taiwan has the minimum only minus 0.6%. The US minus 9.5%. And UK Spain are very severe. And this pandemic also caused collateral damage. It widening the inequality. So this chart shows the inequities by poverty, by clouding, by, by uh, population of color. Uh, it affect people differentially. It also has cloud out effect because it takes away resources that could have been used for other health and other social services. And it also caused mental health, social instability, people lost jobs, and nation state on survival mode and that sometimes behave competitively rather than collaboratively. And we still don't know what this physical distance will have uh, long-term impact on human relationship. And education, when we close school, education suffers. And then US is a little bit unique that we still face those alternative facts about uh, the pandemic. And this is looking at the poverty from the world. We have consecutively improved poverty until the beginning of this year. This was original projection this is the new projection based on the pandemic that we're going to increase global poverty because of the pandemic. That's another collateral damage. And I mentioned this pandemic could have been prevented. There's a failure of global health governance, slow response to nation governance. And how come we didn't develop vaccine since SARS? Had the, had the industry, the researcher collaborated to develop vaccine, we won't have to wait uh, that long to, to, because the, the, the virus are very similar with SARS. And we have inconsistent policy. Uh, last week, the New York Times uh, published this article, the White House blocked CDC from mandating masks on public transit. So what's the world look like after the pandemic? Like we're looking for the new public health and global health, how we can remedy the failure of the global health governance. And there will be a global division of labor shakeup, particularly the supply chain stability and risks. And we'll be seeing divergence of globalization and localization. During the pandemic, I mentioned there's a re-emphasizing of the role of nation state. In instead of collaboration, many, many nation state on the survival mode went for uh, competitiveness. So are we in a, as a global village or global community? It will also affect each country in terms of this pandemic oriented strategic plan in terms of how can we design, redesign a resilient economy and resilient urban planning and strategic industries. And we will rethink about the global governance and global public goods. And right now, uh, the, there's a, a, the concept of global public good has been implemented in terms of global access to, to the potential effective vaccine. So that's a hope uh, in the near future, the post pandemic, we will see a transformed economy. One potential result is a greener world. One side effect during this massive lockdown throughout the world, what the world has been termed greener. And that gave us a lesson how we can reshape that. Uh, the British NHS already declared it will be the world's first carbon net zero healthcare system by 2040. And we may see a regenerated society and resilient humanity that coupled with social vaccine. I will come back to this next slide. And as well, we recognize the importance of health system strengthening and universal healthcare in controlling combating pandemic. So the idea of social vaccine uh, is not new, but has largely been ignored. People only focusing on the biological vaccine. 
The social vaccine includes four important tenets. We need a life with security, opportunity that are fair, planet that is habitable and support biodiversity, and governance that is just. And those social vaccines can help our society be more resilient in terms of preventing or, or confronting, controlling the future, uh, either pandemic or the climate change. So this is the slide I mentioned in July 30th and 31st, Taiwan held a big conference, in-person conference on uh, pandemic. And actually since June, Taiwan has been holding in-person conference. And Taiwan is probably one of the very few countries during this pandemic, this time uh, can help can help uh, in-person uh, conferences. And this is another uh, slide from Taiwan when Taiwan celebrated uh, 50 consecutive days with no domestic cases. Uh, a nation's pandemic control measure is a reflection uh, of the its population's willingness to contribute their part. So before we have effective vaccine that can create herd immunity, I think for the time being, the herd behavior is more critical than waiting for herd immunity. So shall we let the pandemic shape our future world or we should take charge to reshape the world after the pandemic? What kind of world do we want to move in forward rather than return to? And I leave that for us to contemplate. Thank you very much for your patience. And that concludes my presentation. Well, fantastic. And, and thank you so much for that, Dr. Chi. Um, we've got a lot of participation tonight, not necessarily all through questions, just but in viewers. So I just wanna thank everybody again for tuning in tonight for some excellent information. Um, to get us started tonight for some of our questions, um, you have been in the news a lot the last six months. What has, been, how, what has that been like uh, for you as a researcher um, and as a scientist to kind of have this second job, if you will, of speaking with media and being on on news, and what has that been like you for the, for you like this last seven months? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's been both exhausting and enjoyable. Um, as an academic teacher and researcher, uh, especially someone specialized in public health and global health, I acquire my expertise in, in pandemic, specifically the COVID-19 pandemic, partly by my personal interest because I originally came from Taiwan. And in 2003, when SARS, uh, Taiwan was suffering from SARS, I was gathering information about how that pandemic spread in 2003. And that laid the foundation of my knowledge to this pandemic. And because of my interest in that, Last December, and when I started to read news about some new disease emerging in China, I started to pay attention every day. And my wife actually estimated every day I spend at least four to six hours reading those information, those papers. And that cumulatively kind of, not by design, but, but cumulatively I acquired those knowledge specific to this pandemic. And so I was glad uh, with that knowledge, I can be of help uh, to the community, to the society, because one of the biggest concern as an academic is we become irrelevant to the society. And for me, actually, honestly, I wish I didn't have those opportunity. Had there been no pandemic, I would not be in the media so often. I wish that didn't happen, but it happened. So I'm glad that I can make my knowledge be useful uh, to the society. And by society, actually is extend very wide. Uh, sometimes I have to be interviewed in, in the night from Asia because of the time difference. So they are all over the world.
All right, and I'm gonna jump back and forth between our platforms here. And again, thanks everybody for uh, asking questions. Um, one of them coming in is through the presentation, and some of these are gonna be repeats of information that you covered, but I think they're really important uh, just to kind of hit home to the audience. Uh, one question that came in, do you kind of think from this point forward, because um, the pandemic has kind of been cemented, uh, quote unquote, throughout the rest of the world, are you seeing us needing to kind of turn into a uh, face covering society for a while now going forward? Or what's your opinion on that? Yes, it will be a while, but I would not expect and hopefully not forever. Meaning as long as we don't have this pandemic control, by control, meaning every country are able to contain it to the extent there's a no longer community outbreak. There will still be cases. I'm not saying there's zero, zero cases. By control, I mean it's contained to the extent there's no community outbreak. So people feel safe to have the regular activity, be it uh, working in person, go to school in person, or shopping in person. So until that day, we probably will have to wear masks whenever we go to any indoor spaces or outdoor spaces where there is crowded. If you, if you go jogging or walking where there's not many people, uh, I don't think you need to wear ma masks. All right, thank you for that. Um, another topic that's come up a lot um, is this concept of false positives with testing. Um, how have you seen the relationship of potential false positives and how COVID-19 has played out, especially in this country? Well, personally, I'm less concerned about false positive than false negative. Because a false positive is not that bad. It means you tested positive when in fact you are not infected. And that might be we restrain a person from normal activity or going out for say two weeks. And so the, I would say the inference, the negative inference of damage is very minimal for force. I'm not saying there's no, no inference, no damage, there's a damage, but it, it limited people's uh, mobility and activity. But the consequence is far more severe with force negative, meaning you are infected, but tested negative. And some of the test regimen are not so accurate. Well, I shouldn't say some. All test regimen produce both false positive and false negative. And we want to minimize particularly false negative because false negative create a, a high risk, not just for individual, but for the community. The people mistakenly thought he or she has no, has no virus, but in fact, he or she does, and then spread that, uh, that virus. Excellent. Um, next question coming in uh, from one of our YouTubers. Um, what promising treatments or studies do you think we should be watching out for, or do you think are kind of in the, in the near future? Is there anything that folks can read up on to maybe gain a little bit more knowledge around some of the research that's being done around potential treatments? Well, um, I have very limited knowledge on treatment because I'm not a clinician. I'm a public health uh, specialist that I look at the population, not as an individual clinician. So I don't have that expertise. But I do know, <clears throat> as I mentioned in my presentation, by now, uh, research and clinician has gain a lot more knowledge about how to properly treat. For example, <clears throat> one important improvement compared with February and March is early treatment is extremely important. But to have the, for the same med med medication, whether, whether it's a uh, steroid or other medications, uh, the timing is extremely important. If you treat the patient at later sta stage, uh, depending on how severe uh, the virus has spread and attacked your organ, many effective treatment by the time, <clears throat> by the time uh, the virus has attacked the organ, uh, even the most effective medication will not work. So that's something 
a clinician and researcher learn that they didn't know and we didn't know back in February and, and March that why so many, why the same medicine for some people that's effective, for other people ineffective. And this was discovered by around May or so, that is the timing. So early treatment, that means it, we need to have early diagnosis to, to, to confirm the patient has that. And Taiwan uh, has a surplus of capacity because it has so few cases. And so Taiwan put even a symptomatic patient into negative pressure isolation room and treated them with antiviral uh, medication. And the idea is to reduce or minimize their viral load so they are no longer contagious. So these are the knowledge uh, the clinician already know a lot. And last week, uh, President Trump's treatment kind of demonstrated that. That's a, a demonstration of the current state of the art knowledge about the right timing, right medication uh, for, for, for this disease. So th there's, a, there's a good hope that I mentioned in the, in the talk, uh, the case fatality rate now compared with February and March in the same country are much lower because the clinician knows much better to treat that. Excellent. Um, another good question that came up and I think is, is one that I've heard a lot of questions about. And I know we talked about it in even the trivia questions tonight. Um, if immunity after infection lasts only about three to five months with current knowledge, um, how long will immunity last following a vaccination? That's a good question. Um, how long the immunity will follow following a, a vaccination, assuming the vaccine is effective? But that's also a very tricky part because one of the reason uh, the vaccine, uh, the effective vaccine did not come around as soon as we wish uh, is besides safety, uh, it has to do with the immunity nature of this disease. Because this is a coronavirus share a lot of similarity in terms of the virus nature with the, the seasonal flu. And we all know we have good knowledge experience with seasonal flu, that immunity is very short term. And therefore the vaccine for seasonal flu also has a short term immunity, usually about three to five months. And that hopefully when you get the flu shot that lasts for the flu season. And by the time the immunity is gone, the flu season is gone. That's the idea. And so similarly uh, with the, the COVID-19 vaccine, one of the tricky part for the researcher to develop effective vaccine is not only the vaccine has to be effective in preventing infection, but also it has to be effective for a reasonable time. By reasonable time, I think many researchers are looking at at least four to six months, ideally. And of course, by the time we get the effective vaccine, there will be variation because there are many institutions simultaneously develop different approach, different nature of vaccine. And I expect those different vaccine will come with different lengths of uh, immunity. So uh, the, the realistic scenario will be similar with flu vaccine. Uh, by the time we, the vaccine is available, we might have to do at least two doses of the vaccine, sometimes three, right? You, you get the first dose and then maybe four months or five months later, you get the second dose. So that's a very realistic scenario. The only thing that disappoints me about is uh, I thought we were done with booster shots when I was little. So I don't know, <laughs> it'll be okay. For this case, it'll be totally okay. I'll, I'll gladly do that. Um, you know, there was a, a construct that you talked about, the, the social vaccination. I think that is such a, an interesting topic in the sense of it takes a look at a lot of different parts of human life and things that we can make improvements on just to make general health better. And I, I really like that idea. What I'm wondering is, is there some things maybe you could talk a little bit more and I'm just gonna kind of call it out, um, Taiwanese culture and US culture. And what are some things that you think really helped Taiwan come through this quickly? And what are some things that maybe be hurting the United States right now and why we just haven't been as quick um, at all <laughs> with a response? Um, there are 
this is a very, very good and complex question. And we can spend hours to talk about that, but I'm going to, to, to quick, uh, quickly summarize it. Uh, among those factors, one important factor is experience. Taiwan suffers severely from the 2003 SARS. And that's both at the individual level and the government level. And that experience makes Taiwan as a society, the people and the government, extremely responsive and sensitive to any sign, any sign of potential new threat of pandemic, that Taiwan take it very seriously. And one of the, the last, I mentioned triple failure, the last layer, layer of failure is the national level that some country does better than others. Those countries that's not doing very well, one of the factor, including United States, was not taking this threat seriously, the threat of pandemic. And Taiwan took it very seriously. Taiwan was the first nation to respond in December 31st. And on, on January 3rd, Taiwan's government mobilized a high government official to prepare a committee to design the strategy, the plan, embracing the upcoming pandemic, January 3rd. And Taiwan had its first case on January 21st. So that shows how early, how soon Taiwan took the action. So that at the government level, but also at the general public level, I mentioned uh, the, the people in Taiwan had that experience that helped. Uh, so for example, uh, the restriction on, on, on some activities, particularly wearing masks, to school, to office, to shop, to, to public transportation, uh, there's very little resistance because people did that, has done that in 2003 during the SARS. Unfortunately, in the US, we have one complicating factor, not many countries suffers. That is the, the pandemic has been politicized. That's very unfortunate. And Within my circle, my graduate student told me firsthand that her family, their family, their neighborhood all belong to the, I call it pandemic denier. Despite all the deaths and cases, there are still those people out there who think this whole pandemic is hoax. So when you have that, let's say we have 20% of American belong to the pandemic de uh, denier no amount of evidence can convince them and they will not take any preventive measure or action because it doesn't exist in, in their mind. So that's a, a complicating factor preventing our society from implementing a more effective uh, pandemic control measure. Yeah, yeah, in interesting, interesting point, interesting point. Um, there's been a lot go on <laughs> in the last 10 months. Um, yeah, that's, I, think that's, I think that's very interesting, very interesting. It almost makes you wonder too, and this is just something I've thought about is, you know, how much more of an impact would this have had to make on us as a country to come to that same realization that happened with SARS in, in Taiwan back in 2003. Like I, I think that we should have been there already, but that's my personal opinion. I, I just, I'm putting that out there. Um, but one, uh, one of the questions that's come up is, is we talked about the kind of the revaccination piece, the three to five month period. Um, one couple of the stories that have come out have been folks that have recovered from COVID and then have been reinfected with what seems to be a more powerful strain of COVID. Um, what should we make of those cases? Well, uh, we still know very little so far because <clears throat> Well, there are people who be being reinfected. Uh, the numbers so far are relatively small. We only know it is possible to be reinfected. And so I think the researchers are still uh, doing their work, try to investigate what are the consequences of reinfection. And one theory, one theory, this is still a theory need, need to be proved, is for people who got reinfected, their immunity might be stronger and therefore last longer. Because this reinfection and reinforcing immunity is not a unique phen phenomenon. 
uh, it's actually a very common phenomenon for many communicable diseases that in many common communicable diseases, people reinfected and every time they're reinfected, the immune system got stronger and stronger and stronger. But for this COVID-19, because it's new and researchers are still trying to investigate, is that the same phenomenon? People got reinfected and survived. They had to survive first and survive and will their immunity be stronger and therefore last longer? Well, great. Well, thank you so much again uh, for your time. I um, we've gone through, like I said, the majority of the questions tonight. These are going to keep rolling, folks. If you have questions post event, please be sure uh, to get them to events at osucascades.edu, uh, and we will make sure to get them uh, to Dr. Chi. Um, I just want to say again, everyone, thank you so much for viewing tonight. Um, big shout out to yourself <laughs> for um, this presentation this evening. I know it's been kind of a, uh, I guess, as you said tonight. Um, an unwelcomed passion for you now that you wish you didn't have to talk about, but I'm glad we have you uh, to do so. So thank you so much for that. Uh, special shout out to OSU University Events and then uh, Connect Central Oregon for online production tonight uh, in, our, in our new setup. So everybody in the audience, please stay tuned. You saw in the slides earlier, hopefully, uh, to stay tuned for registrations for the upcoming Science Pub entitled Fires in the West, coming to you on Monday, November 9th, featuring Dr. Erica Fisher. Um, other than that, again, I really appreciate everybody's time tonight. Had fun. Um, very, very interesting, very interesting talk, topic to talk about this evening. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time uh, at Science Pub. So have a great evening. And this concludes our event for uh, tonight, October 12th, 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.